Welcome to the Transformative Play Initiative Spring uh, Series. We are so blessed to be here with John Stravopoulos, uh, who is a safety expert and wonderful human being just in general. So um, I just know that you're going to be super uh, excited about everything he has to say. Um, so a couple of things. We're part of the Transformative Play Initiative at Uppsala University, the Department of Game Design. Um, and so this is an ongoing series that uh, hopefully will last uh, at least to the end of this semester, if not further. And uh, this particular season is going to focus on safety and psychological safety specifically, um, although we will also be covering other kinds of topics. Um, so the structure is we're going to have a one hour lecture and then we'll have 30 minutes of Q&A. If you would like to ask questions, please use the Q&A function. Uh, so there should be a little button at the bottom that says Q&A. And um, if you post it in the chat, John won't necessarily be moderating that or, or reading it. So we'll just post it into the Q&A uh, for later. Um, so uh, like I said, I'm really excited to have John here. Um, he and I have worked on many projects together in terms of safety design and uh, trying to figure out how to cr create safer spaces. Um, I could say a lot more about that, but I think his work will speak for itself. Um, let me give you a little bit about his bio. So he asks the question, or sorry, uh, his bio. John Stravopoulos is a proven design leader with 20 plus years of experience, creating experiences for games, governments, sports, and museums. Notable clients include David Bowie, the Museum of Modern Art, the New York Yankees, and NASA. Stravopoulos' game design focuses on growing psychological safety and diversity, equity, and inclusion. His work appears in hundreds of prod products, including Dungeons and Dragons, Critical Role, Nike, and the History Channel. He has also taught game design at the Museum of Moving Image and NYU. His designs have won awards from Gen Con, UX Magazine, and Code for America. At every company he has worked for, he has implemented systemic change to increase DEI hiring. And so with that, I will pass it over to John. Excellent, thank you so much, Tara. I really appreciate being invited onto this. Uh, do I sound all right in terms of audio? Okay, perfect. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Excellent. Can you all see this? Cool. So let's get started. Okay, so as uh, Sarah mentioned, we're here to talk about psychological safety, specifically in the context of games. So let's talk about clearly establishing an agenda as far as what we're going to be focusing uh, learning today. And so today we're gonna to be talking about exactly what is psychological safety. These terms get bandied around quite a bit and they mean different things in different contexts. The different meanings are all valid depending on their specific uh, uses, but we're gonna be very specific today about what we mean. Uh, why is it important? how can your games facilitate psychological safety? And just a note about games, uh, I work in both product design, product management, and sometimes that involves games, but I found a lot of these techniques are useful whether you're creating a game or a user interface, an application, et cetera. These are not just limited to games, although we will be speaking about the context of games today. Uh, we're going to go over examples of psychological safety in Dungeons and Dragons, uh, both existing uh, techniques that it uses, as well as recent techniques it's been adding. And then uh, I've been doing this in terms of psychological safety for about a decade, so I've learned quite a bit in that time, uh, places where I could have done more, places where I didn't realize how successful certain things would be and lots of things that I would do differently now. So I wanna go over the lessons that I've learned after a decade of practicing this. 
okay, who am I? I will not go over this since Sarah did with such a wonderful job. Thank you, Sarah, again. Okay, let's talk about what is psychological safety. So first, let's talk about the research. So in uh, 2012 to 2014, Google embarked to learn about what makes a team in their organization high, high performing compared to all other teams. And so from, for about two to three years, they studied 180 groups within Google itself. They had statisticians involved, uh, organizational psychologists, researchers, uh, UX designers, et cetera. And they ran through a statistical analysis that both was tied to the results of their work, the various metrics attached to work, but also the performance metrics for each of the individuals and teams. So what did they learn? So Google, after the two to three years of research, learned that individual skills, background, and experiences did not matter, or at least statistically were not relevant enough to stand out. Uh, specifically, it's how the individuals work together in a group that mattered. So you could have a group where one or two people are high performing themselves, but if the way they work together was lacked the things we're about to talk about, then it didn't matter. The whole group as a whole was not able to act and perform at that same level. So what was the most important factor? Psychological safety. And we'll define that in a moment. Before we do that, I wanna to touch on other factors that they found, uh, dependability, structure, clarity, meaning, and impact uh, were all other factors that mattered in terms of team's performance although psychologically, psychological safety was the number one. So psychological safety, what is it? Uh, it's the perception, not necessarily the reality, but the perception of consequences of taking a risk uh, while being vulnerable. Likely that means that there's no guaranteed success. The risk that you're taking is effectively a gamble and you're facing uncertainty in front of a group, in front of your teammates, your peers, et cetera. So the amount of psychological safety is measured by these things. You can assess psychological safety in your team uh, by answering the following questions. Uh, if you're working on a group project and you make a mistake, is it held against you? Right? Do you people focus on, oh, the blame, right? This person did this wrong, or do they work together to solve the problem collaboratively? Do you feel safe asking for help? Some people don't want to ask for help because they don't want to admit that they don't know something. So in an environment where people feel comfortable asking for help uh, makes a huge difference in terms of increasing psychological safety. Can you raise problems without consequence? In some uh, less psychologically safe environments, people will raise problems and then the messenger will be treated as if they were the problem. Like there's this kind of logical fallacy where a person, let's say a, a manager or a leader wasn't aware of the problem, the, a person raises a problem with them, all of a sudden they associate the problem with the person who raised it because prior to that, they didn't know the problem existed. And so then some way in this weird dynamic, the person raising the issue is actually blamed for it, even if they could have nothing to do with it. So having a more psychological safe team also includes having the ability to raise problems, uh, to give feedback without negative consequences. Do you feel safe uh, taking action uh, when success is uncertain? I knew a lot of people in the studies that Google did who felt less psychological safe, psychologically safe tried to work only on projects that they thought would be successful regardless of what the team did. But we have a lot of problems that are, they, the solutions that we come up with may or may not work. And if people only focus on the easy things, there's a whole series of problems that will 
rarely get addressed. So this can be quite problematic. Uh, and finally, are your individual skills and differences valued? So a team isn't, in this context, a team is one that acts as a group, but respects the individual parts and does not require assimilation. Assimilation in this context would mean everyone has the same opinions, they're acting as one, et cetera. Uh, this situation where people feel comfortable being themselves is a core component of being comfortable, being vulnerable, asking for help, uh, raising problems, offering ideas, et cetera. If they feel valued for their unique experiences and differences, they will feel more comfortable uh, offering information that is fueled by those differences, which is critical for solving problems. Okay. Why is this important? I mean, generally speaking, uh, some of this is obvious why it's important, uh, but let's go into the details. Okay. So many people in the United States, I'm gonna be talking about United States statistics specifically, uh, many people in the United States are vulnerable to psychologically unsafe environments. Specifically, uh, seven out of 10 people will experience a traumatic event in their lives in the US, and two out of 10 people have anxiety-related disorders that may or may not be uh, tied to a traumatic event. But nonetheless, there's a 20% uh, of the population that deals with anxiety in a psychologically unsafe environment, whether it's a group, a team, a project, a game, is going to uh, affect their performance. But interestingly, among gamers in the United States, the number of people with anxiety-related disorders is 10% higher. It's three out of 10 people. So the reason I laid this out is it, it affects us, it's important. And a lot of the changes and techniques that we're gonna be discussing in this talk are fairly easy to implement. And I think given how many people can be positively affected by small changes, it's definitely worth our time. So why do I care about this? Um, I care about this for a lot of different reasons. Uh, I'm a human-centered designer. So I care a lot about uh, people, solving the problems, empathy, but also this is something that's personal to me. Uh, I'm a person who grew up in an immigrant family. Uh, English was my second language. Uh, we struggled heavily with poverty. Uh, we didn't live in one place. We were often couch surfing. We really only survived due to the kindness of others. And because of that, I've also struggled in my life with PTSD related to that poverty. Um, fortunately, it's something that I've worked through and had a lot of positive experience and even grown from and gained valuable uh, growth from. But I understand and empathize how difficult these things can be. And I want to do everything I can to make these situations safe for myself, safer for myself, and hopefully safer for others. Now, a lot of uh, the classes that uh, Sarah has been talking, teaching, I believe, are all about transformative growth, uh, or at least transformative growth is a huge part of it. To be able to grow, we have to be vulnerable, right? We have to be in a situation where we open up about either areas of that are short, we perceive as shortcomings, uh, things that we want to improve on, right? It takes courage to be honest about those things. You have to be vulnerable if you're going to grow. And so a lot of what we're doing here is creating circumstances that allow people to feel more comfortable being vulnerable, which hopefully then increases their chances of growing. Uh, my friend Lucian, uh, who designed the game Visigoths versus Molgoths, has a lovely section uh, in his game uh, called the pizza metaphor that is relevant to our discussion. So let's take a look. So in uh, Visigoths versus uh, Molgoths, a TTRPG by Lucian Khan, uh, it says, although the usual tone of Visigoths versus Molgoths 
uh, Molgoth specifically, is lighthearted and absurd, like all interactive media, it runs the risk of entering emotional or psychologically challenging territory. Uh, I want to take a step back there and underline some things, which is when we talk about games, especially uh, role-playing games, LARPs, uh, business simulations, these are often improv-based activities. Some portion of the activities are not decided in advance. So anybody can do anything at any time within a certain constraints. So given that, uh, it's we're, there's always a risk that it's going to enter a territory that you may not be aware of or expect it, even if you're engaging in a lighthearted activity. This sounds like a, a negative. For me, it's a positive. It's It makes these sort of games exciting, uh, but it's something that it's worth being aware of. So what is the pizza metaphor? So uh, Lucian says, you wouldn't surprise your friends with anchovies on pizza night, would you? Uh, it's a better idea to discuss with your friends ahead of time what pizza toppings you'll want and don't want. Uh, a role-playing game is a pizza. Maybe you'd uh, want to use this chapter, chapter's recommended safety techniques. Maybe you don't want to use them. But either way, at least talk to your friends about what type of content you all want and don't want in a story. A short conversation can save the pizza party. So the reason why I quote this, besides um, finding it quite clever, is sometimes when we talk about psychological safety, people respond as if it's a something unique, special, uh, strange. But for me, a lot of this is just uh, common realities as far as different people having different needs and needing accommodations. So for example, if I uh, have an allergy, uh, I would like to talk with the folks who are in charge of food to make them aware of my allergy and hopefully uh, some accommodations can be made where I can eat safely at the event. Uh, if for some reason that's not possible, accommodations uh, cannot be offered, then I knew that going in and can make a decision whether this is an event activity game that's right for me or not. So I, I view this as an everyday thing, whether it's people dealing with allergies, whether it's people who have disabilities, who need accommodations, whatever it might be, it's helpful to set up a framework where we respect individuals' differences and needs and to be accommodating. So when you encourage being vulnerable, you're decreasing, rather, let me take a step back. When you're increasing psychological safety, you are decreasing the perception of consequences. You're decreasing the perception of uncertainty. And you're increasing people's comfort taking risks and people feeling comfortable being vulnerable in front of others. Great, but how do we do this? So I've, there are many different techniques. I've broken them down into four categories, uh, although we could approach this in multiple ways. So let's start with this, and then uh, in the Q&A, we can add additional techniques as far as how to implement psychological safety. But my first category is information. Uh, you can increase psychological safety by uh, how you onboard someone into a game, an event, a team, a project, etc., by being transparent, by not surprising people, and by identifying your own biases. So let's zoom in. What do we mean about onboarding that helps increase psychological safety? We mean setting clear expectations so people can opt in or opt out. Uh, I can't opt into something if I or even opt out of something if I don't really know what that thing is. Uh, to, that per, to that goal, having an outline, right? Whether you have a meeting and you wanna set an agenda so people know what to expect, how they can participate, or if this is something that's worth their time, having outlines in advance are very useful. Setting clear goals so people know how to engage. Uh, setting clear boundaries, uh, offering people the opportunity to 
add boundaries if they have their own unique boundaries so that they know that those things will be respected setting clear options as far as how people engage within a game within a project what are they allowed to do uh, showing them what's next right as you're going through things forecast what they can expect next will allow people to prepare as needed uh, show how much is left and uh, this last one sounds funny but scare people away <laughs> so what i mean by this is it's a better outcome if you are honest about what your activity is and that results in people deciding they don't want to participate that is a positive outcome it's a positive outcome for you but it's especially a positive outcome for them you want to give people information so that they feel confident in how they're spending their time don't make things sound inaccurate for the purposes of marketing something that might then give people the wrong expectations about what it is. Be transparent, be clear. And that means also being clear about who this is not for and letting those people decide if that's indeed the case for them. Uh, transparency, one thing that uh, we've done in a variety of games and projects is making materials available in advance. So if you're organizing a game, can I read a script as far as what's involved in the game before I play? Can I get an outline of how long the game is, what we're doing at different points, uh, how I'm going to participate? Having an outline or agenda that's available in advance allows people to make informed choices, which we discussed a bit in onboarding, but sometimes you could say something like, this is going to be a horror experience where you will be playing characters confronting their pasts in you know, a haunted mansion. That's definitely useful. It definitely tells me quite a bit, but if I can see the outline, if I can see the materials in advance, there might be specifics within that description that I would have never thought of, that would have been included in that game. So having that information in advance can be quite useful. Uh, in that same idea, not having any surprises, uh, unless the point of this activity is that it is a surprise, right? So some activities are about surprises. And if that's the case, you can make that transparent. Make it transparent that there's twists and turns and surprises and things that you think are one thing are actually another. If you make that clear up front, then people can at least opt into that. And so another way of increasing psychological safety is identifying your own bias, right? And that can be difficult to do. In the way we write, in the way we talk, Often we can use certain words, phrases that showcase a bias towards specific groups of people or people who have similar experiences, et cetera. And the way we talk might signal to people that yes, this is an activity where you are welcome. It also might signal this is an activity that, where you, that might actually be unfriendly to you. And you might be doing this without even realizing it. So there are tools uh, that are quite amazing. Uh, Textio, Grammarly, Business, Data People. Uh, all of these tools will allow you to input your text of various sorts, whether it's your marketing for a game, the game text itself, uh, characters for a game, whatever you, as long as it's in the text form, you can enter them into these sort of tools and they identify the various bias patterns that they've identified and then they send you that information and then you can adjust it based on whether that bias is something that you purposely want. And if it's not something you purposely want, it'll help you identify that and change it. This is definitely uh, something that I'm very happy about our modern world, having predictive AI and training models to allow us to do this is something that's fantastic. This is something that in the past would take us weeks that you can now do in minutes. leadership. So as a leader, as a facilitator, uh, as a manager, there are a variety of things that you can do from your position of leadership to increase psychological safety. So one of them is listen more than you talk. 
Uh, of course, I feel strange saying that since I'm going to be talking for the next hour. Uh, my ideal situation is I'm listening and other people are talking, but unfortunately, and fortunately, uh, that's not what we're here to do today. But if this was a team I was managing, uh, I would be practicing listening more than I talk. Uh, don't make assumptions. Uh, ask people, listen, confirm that you understand what they're saying, and collaborate. If you're doing something or making a decision about something that affects specific people, then give those specific people the power to also make a decision for themselves. Right? Don't assume what's good for someone. Uh, talk to them, listen, confirm, and then give them power. As a leader, uh, you're also in a wonderful position to model the behavior that you want to see from your team. So psychological safety, you could present a variety of techniques. You can make a lot of specific design choices about your game or your system that will promote psychological behavior, but uh, safe behavior. But there are times where you say something and people may not understand what you actually mean. They may not uh, feel confident in what you're saying, or they might not believe it until they see it, right? So as a leader, you're in a position to model the behavior that you want from the group. So you can encourage the concept of no bad ideas. You know, one thing I like to do is I like to actually uh, either present a lot of ideas, like I'll say, you know, there are no bad ideas here. Let's say we're brainstorming. And then I will lead with, for example, here's a bunch of bad ideas. And then I'll present some obviously bad ideas. And then I'll pick one of them and say, okay, that was a bad idea. But actually, if I take a step back, this thing I can take out of it that could actually be useful. So let's not prejudge. More ideas are better. Let's gather them. Even if you think they're bad, maybe there's something that we can take from them to actually, that will actually be useful for us. And by creating that sort of context and environment, people, there's a more free flow of information. People feel uh, safer to share information that actually could be very useful to us. And if you don't do this, they might keep it to themselves and then you lose out. Uh, own your own biases, right? So if you have a certain bias, say it, right? Like I have a bias uh, because of my education where I studied X, Y, Z. So I just want everyone to know that I'm coming from that perspective. Uh, if I'm saying something that may not make sense to you given your experience, let's, let's talk about it. Let's, I'll own my bias, you share your experience and let's figure out together what makes sense for our group. Uh, acknowledge your fallibility. Right. If you make mistakes, that's actually great. Uh, tell people that you made mistakes and show them that ideally there are no consequences for certain kinds of mistakes. Right. Uh, there is, of course, negligence and gross negligence. We're not talking about those sort of mistakes. But if someone's making a fairly benign, uh, unintentional mistake, share that with folks and make it clear that it's okay. Right? It's better to make, make mistakes and own them faster so that we can work together to solve them. Uh, be vulnerable, ask people how you could do better. Right, So like solicit feedback, specific, specifically as a leader, tell your group, how can I do better for you? Right, Which is effectively saying, I know there are things that I'm not doing as well as I could. And additionally, I want to do specifically what's best or most helpful for you and for you to decide what that is, right? And that puts you in a vulnerable position, but it's also quite a healthy position. Uh, share your own boundaries, your needs, your preferences, because uh, by doing so, you are encouraging others that they can also do the same. Equitable communication. So different people communicate in different ways. As I mentioned, English is my second language. Uh, I've lived in the US for so long that it doesn't feel that way anymore, but I do remember what it was like uh, early on. And so different people 
collaborate and brain, brainstorm in different ways. Some folks prefer to write things down and then share it. Some people are excited to do things in front of a group. Other people want to have a break from everyone else to be able to go somewhere separately, to think through their ideas, write them down, organize them, then come back to the group and share them. Offer different ways for people to communicate and collaborate so that people can bring their best selves to the group. Uh, I've seen folks have alternative back channels, kind of like we have here uh, for communication. So you can have a group dialogue, but folks could introduce their ideas without necessarily verbally speaking aloud. Uh, do everything you can to ensure that everyone's voice is included. Uh, take audit of your meetings, right? If you have a meeting or you're playing a game and you know that these three people talked a lot, these two people talked a medium amount, this one person barely said anything and this one person talked too much, uh, assess what, why that is, speak to the people in an unpressured way and ask them how you can help them uh, make the game the best experience for them and do what they tell you. Don't make assumptions. Empower those who are most affected. Make room in your schedules to actually make changes. So this is a point I'll talk a little bit more later, but I see a lot of people uh, having good intentions, right? They wanna make changes, they wanna solicit feedback, they wanna learn, they wanna grow. Uh, but if you don't actually make room in your schedule to do those things, then it will never become the priority. So make sure that if this is something that's important to you, you're trying to iterate a process, uh, iterate a game, a design project, how you work together, put time on your calendar specifically for this. Otherwise, you may never have the time or never prioritize it. Uh, recognizing effort and accomplishments, right? So. One way to encourage people to feel uh, safe contributing is to actually acknowledge their contribute, contributions. And don't just acknowledge folks who are doing the best work or uh, who are doing above and beyond. Like I, I've seen situations where the people who are overworking are the only people who are recognized. And then you're sending the message to everyone else, hey, we actually, don't care what you do unless you're overworking, working late nights or the weekends, right? Like recognize the effort and accomplishments of your team, of your players, et cetera. And that will bolster the sort of behaviors that you're looking for. Make time to address issues with folks, right? That's similar to putting time in your calendar, block time off to actually address these things. Let's say you're running a game uh, at a convention and you are in a four hour time slot. If you're in a four hour time slot, you probably have actually more like three hours, right? Between people starting late, people having to leave early, breaks, uh, questions, teaching the game, et cetera. You have much less time than you think. So if you actually also want to solicit feedback, from the participants, you actually need to budget that time as well. And you won't be able to successfully budget that time if you're not also realistic about everything else you have to do. Replace blame with curiosity. So let's go into more details there. So So there, replacing blame with curiosity is something that is difficult. Um, it's something that I've seen folks put an earnest effort into, but uh, struggle to have stick. Uh, so let's talk through some of those techniques in detail. So generally speaking, you don't want to have a situation where blame is common, right? Because bl blaming someone usually creates a conflict or escalates conflict. Uh, blaming someone causes people to be defensive, and then eventually they're so defensive they disengage, right? That's not a psychological safe environment. It's not a good team dynamic. You're not going to get people's best selves in their work. Um, so blame is, is uh, an unhelpful thing for your goals. So how, how do you replace blame with curiosity? So when you have a conflict or you a problem arises, instead of blaming someone for something, you can state uh, what the outcome is, like 
X thing happened, right? I've, I have observed X thing has occurred. Uh, you can label it as potentially a, a group issue or a systemic issue or a process issue, right? Like X outcome is occurring that I've observed. Uh, this could be something that has to do with how we all work together, right? Don't focus on a person or an individual. Don't make it personal. Uh, use factual neutral language uh, and make it about everyone coming together to figure out how you can reach a different outcome. Uh, engage in collaborative exploration. Frame potential solutions as hypotheses to test rather than guarantees. Uh, the reason that's important is sometimes people throw solutions out there and they're like, yeah, we, we solved the problem. And then uh, they get frustrated that what they expected to happen didn't exactly happen, right? P frame solutions as here are the things we're going to try out, test, gather information, learn, and then test again. Uh, and ask for feedback, right? Tell, ask people in terms of changing this outcome, what worked, uh, what didn't work about how I raised this issue, what worked about how I described this issue, right? Like, how do you feel about that? Um, how could I have presented this information more effectively? Uh, how could I have facilitated the group discussion as far as coming up with uh, ideas to test as potential solutions, right? Ask for feedback, making it, you making it less personal, you're showing your own vulnerability, you're modeling the behavior you're looking for. And then ideally through all of this, you're shifting away from blame towards curiosity, which is all about collaboration in this context. Okay, let's talk about how you can increase psychological safety of interpersonally, often usually through relationships to each other. So one thing you can do is alleviate the pr pressure, right? So some people, when they're one-on-one -on -one facing each other uh, with limited time, feel pressure and they don't necessarily bring their best selves in that context. So allow people to make choices the way that is best for them, separate from the group uh, via alternate modes of uh, communication. Uh, give people the option to give feedback privately or anonymously, right? Create a form or survey, let people send in information as they come up with ideas and periodically review it, right? Don't, if you put someone on the spot, they may not feel able to be as honest as you need them to be to solve the problems you're looking to solve. Okay. Now we've talked about conflict. When people talk about psychological safety, they often confuse that with having no conflict. But I think conflict is important, right? Like different people, this conflict is sometimes part of how you recognize each other's differences, different experiences, different points of view. They're gonna people, be people who have different ideas, right? And if you focus primarily on avoiding conflict, uh, they might not be very constructive. It might not help you achieve your goals. So one of the ways that uh, I've seen help increase people's comfort in engaging in conflict in a way that's constructive is via retrospectives. Uh, this is something that comes up from agile development scrum techniques. Uh, you can apply this to games as well. Uh, a little bit later, I'm gonna be talking about some new techniques that have been introduced to Dungeons and Dragons. Retrospectives is one of them. So a retrospective is where you get the group together you schedule in advance so people know what's coming. And you simply ask what's currently working, what isn't working, uh, what is, what are we not sure of? Like there are things that maybe it's working, maybe it's not, don't have enough information yet. And for the things that are not working, what would you like us to change 
next time. And then you do this again and again and again, right? Uh, in agile development, typically people do it every two weeks. Uh, you can do it at the end of every game, after, let's say you're playing Dungeons and Dragons after your characters level up, check in with people, ask them, hey, what's currently working that you want more of? What would you like me to change? What do you want less of? Um, and in terms of the things that are not working, what can we do together to help mitigate that? So that's what a retrospective is. It's a place where we can offer information that seems like it's a conflict and sometimes is, but in a way that is uh, not personal and will not escalate problems, but actually give us the information we need to iterate forward. Other techniques I've seen in terms of increasing psychological safety are assigning a coach, right? Uh, so someone's new to a group, someone's new to an activity, someone's playing a game for the first time, uh, working with them to choose another person who's participating, who has more experience to join up with that person and act as their buddy, where if that person has questions, which they likely will, they have a person that they can ask first before they raise it with everyone else, which as they go back and forth, they might be, feel more comfortable going to their buddy first. Um, and that creates a situation where they don't feel like they're wasting people's time, yet they still are getting what they need to be able to quickly learn how this team, this group, this project, this game works. So like assigning a specific person to act as a buddy, act as a coach for people who uh, are new to something is something that will allow them to feel more comfortable. And let's talk about structure. So other ways that you can increase psychological safety is by shortening the distance to completion. Uh, so what we mean by this is if a person has a goal and there are all of these steps that they need to take to achieve that goal, assessing what of these steps are actually required, right? What can you do to get someone from their goal to their outcome as fast as you can within reason? Identifying, assessing the situation, looking for things that are steps that might be due to bureaucracy, due to his history for whatever reason. It's something that we've always done, but haven't really assessed if it still serves us. Take a look at those things and remove those. Be consistent. Inconsistency uh, makes people more anxious, right? So if you have a game that has a certain user interface uh, and then when you switch to a different mode, that interface completely changes and for unpredictable and unclear reasons, that's going to make people feel uh, awkward. It's going to make them feel they might question exactly like what they know, what they don't know. Well, if that changed, what else could change, right? So try to be consistent as much as possible. And if things are going to change, uh, foreshadow that. Uh, be transparent about it and ease people into it. You want to forgive mistakes generously. So we talked about modeling uh, behavior and admitting the mistakes that you make if you're uh, in a leadership position. Uh, other ways from a structural perspective that you can forgive mistakes generously is by reward learning from mistakes, uh, make it easy to make different choices. So for example, uh, in Critical Role, we, uh, which is a role-playing game uh, that is very similar to Dungeons and Dragons, uh, in that game, we introduced a rule where if your character dies, uh, and you come back, you actually come back in a way that is different. Uh, and in many ways, 
not just reflects that your character went through this ordeal, but actually gives you advantages. So all of a sudden, this thing that uh, comes from mistakes in the game actually gets rewarded, and then it lowers the anxiety that you might feel from having your character fail at something and from dying, right? Because we actually effectively reward dying and reward making the mistakes that lead up to that. Uh, minimizing consequences in Dungeons and Dragons, there's hit points, right? So your character has uh, a number that as they go up, increase in level, that number goes up. And so that number represents how many times you can fail at something or how many times an opponent can succeed against you before your character is taken out of that situation. So it's not a situation where if someone runs up to your character with a sword, strikes you once, oh, you fail to get out of the way, oh, I'm dead. Instead, you have hit points, which means that you can get hit one, two, three, four, ten times. And so that way, it minimizes the consequences of making mistakes, which then increases people's uh, ability to be vulnerable and then take more risks. So another thing that I like to do, both in the context of work and in games, is measure psychological safety, right? So you're using a variety of techniques. Different, different techniques will work with different people. But then there's also questions of how those techniques are implemented. You need data. So I will measure psychological safety often by surveying folks. Uh, and allowing them to give me feedback anonymously. Uh, I know Google, for example, will ask uh, employees, how confident are you that you won't receive retaliation or criticism if you admit an error or make a mistake, right? And they continually survey, survey folks, and then they tie that metric to the performance evaluations of those employees' managers. Right, so psychological safety becomes a new uh, metric in which if you increase it, then the manager themselves also receives rewards. So you're continually measuring it, you're rewarding uh, the behaviors that increase it, and you're also getting information about if it's working or not. So we've talked about what psychological safety is, why it's important, different ways you can implement it. Let's talk about different ways you can implement it or it has been implemented in specific games. So let's go to examples. I'm gonna do a quick time check. We have about 10 minutes. 10 minutes, fantastic. Get a drink of water. Okay, great. So what are examples of uh, psychological safety in Dungeons and Dragons? We're gonna talk about examples that increase psychological safety. We're gonna talk about barriers to psychological safety in Dungeons and Dragons and new techniques that have been incorporated to increase psychological safety. So let's talk about existing techniques. So, In Dungeons and Dragons, uh, it creates a social environment in which adults can engage in age appropriate activity that allows them to play. Playing is a form of experimentation. Uh, it's something that uh, requires being vulnerable to some extent. And it's something that adults do less and less as they get older. Dungeons and Dragons uh, creates an environment and sets expectations where it's okay for adults to play. So that's something that's quite positive. It's a collaborative versus a competitive activity. You collaborate with your other players, uh, focusing on the group, not just on an individual. It's a structured way to get to know people. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons is fairly small. 
size. You know, we're talking about anywhere from three to five players, uh, but it's not too small. So if you're in a one-on-one situation or even a uh, one-in-two situation, three players total, that might be a situation where everything you do matters. And then that might escalate uh, the weight that those choices have. But if you're in a group that's like four to five to six people, then you ha- you're carrying less of the burden. Uh, you can take a step back, let others take a step forward, but it's not so big that you get lost. So I feel like the size of the groups in Dungeons Dragons uh, are actually quite productive in terms of getting the team to work together. Uh, combat is fast. Uh, in the latest edition of Dungeons & Dragons, it's been mathematically optimized, generally speaking, so that combat lasts three rounds. Uh, in the past, uh, it could go on forever, and people get tired, they disengage, etc. Here, they've reduced uh, the steps required to your goal completion, so combat is optimized. Uh, you have a character. Uh, Your character gives you an alibi. Hey, this is not me doing this. This is my character doing this. You're empathizing for uh, a different person in a different context. It makes you feel more comfortable taking risks. Uh, The game presents a simpler time, right? It has less, you don't have cell phones. You don't have like, oh God, I got to wake up early in the morning. Uh, My character has to wake up early in the morning to get to this job. Everything is just simpler. It's it's fantasy. And that's something that lets people relax. It allows you to test skills before using them in real life, right? So uh, you might be playing a character who's a leader and you have to give a speech. Uh, That allows you to actually literally do that like literally give that speech in a way that is low risk right like if you don't do a good job uh your character didn't do a good job it wasn't you and there's no consequences uh we mentioned earlier that dungeon dragons is designed so that making mistakes uh are not punished generally speaking you have hit points you can make mistakes frequently and you are not taken out of the game They also create a situation where it's easy to be creative. You're not staring at a blank piece of paper. You have a character sheet that has structured information where if you're not sure what to do, you can just look at this, pick an option and do that. Uh, Paired with that is there are very specific defined actions. So you can kind of do whatever you want, but then you can also default to one of 10 choices. Right. So that's something that can help reduce anxiety, because if you're not sure what to do, you could be like, cool, I'll do number two. Uh, It has a equitable systems of participation. For example, in combat, you roll initiative. You each have your own turn. You take turns taking actions. You're not all doing it at the same time. Uh, There are games where you all take actions at the same time. People are talking over each other. It's actually set up where you know when your turn is and you uh, have an opportunity to listen to others and then you know when you're going to participate in the group. The game also recognizes recognizes the player's uh, participation, accomplishments. You literally gain power, right? As you win battles, uh, your character levels up. So that recognizes both your character, but also makes you feel accomplished as a person. Uh, Let's talk about some of the additions to Dungeons & Dragons. So in Dungeons and Dragons, uh, in the latest uh, Ravenloft uh, book, it includes supplemental information that uh, dungeon masters can include in their games. Uh, I was one of the participants in coming up with that uh, those options. So in Ravenloft, it introduces a variety of techniques in D&D. Uh, you have session zero, where your group gets together in advance and uh, you discuss what your boundaries are, you set expectations. Uh, There's a content survey where you can, in a very non-pressure way, review what the game is about and make choices about what you wanna opt into and what you're not comfortable with. There are a variety of tools for opting out of uh, content that you're not wanting to engage with. 
Uh, there's a technique called the X card, uh, which allows you to flag content as you're playing. So if let's say in that session zero, the beginning of the game, you didn't specify that X, Y, Z is a boundary. And then that those things come up just because you didn't bring them up at the beginning of the game doesn't mean now you can't set a boundary. So there's tools that you can then on the fly say, actually, I prefer not to include that. Uh, there, there's information about accessibility accommodations, right? Like some people like to play music in the background, but actually that might be too distracting for people. So there's different ways to talk to your the different participants and participants and make sure that you are accommodating their needs. Uh, we talked about retrospectives earlier. Those are now baked into the game where you can, on a ritual basis, talk with people, ask them what they want less of, more of, what you can do differently. You're frequently getting feedback. I would love to jump into lessons quickly. Uh, how much time do I have? I'm sure it's very little, but what is it? Why don't we do uh, five minutes? Can you do that? That would be perfect. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. So what are some lessons that I've learned after doing this for a, a decade? Uh, it, by doing this, I mean coming up with psychological safe tools, working with companies and designers to integrate uh, psychological safety into their games or identify things that would decrease psychological safety and redesigning around that. So the things that I've learned in the last 10 years uh, rules are not enough, right? So you might have a rule, but someone might not know the rule exists. They might not understand how to use it. They might not have been given practice in using that tool. Uh, rules are not enough, right? Like you need to have a situation where if a rule does not work, you have a culture that uh, respects each other and you give people opportunity to talk about their needs and say, okay, we have this rule that's supposed to make me feel psychologically safe, except I don't. Uh, so what are my options? Can we talk about it? Can we talk about using different tools? Making space to have those conversations and not assuming that just because you introduced a tool, you're automatically good to go and don't have to think about this anymore uh, is a mistake. You need to continually discuss as a group what your different needs are and how you can help each other. Uh, this is a big one. So not big in terms of talking about, but big in terms of impact. So different people can have accessibility needs that are in conflict. Uh, conflict is not automatically abuse. Co uh, accommodations can be in conflict. Uh, without it being personal. So what do I mean by this? So for example, uh, I have three examples here. I know folks who have certain forms of ADHD, not all ADHD is the same, where subtitles on watching a show is actually distracting for them. But uh, they might have roommates or family members or whoever who are hard of hearing who subtitles are a positive thing for. So you have two different people, different uh, accessibility needs, both are valid. They might be doing a group activity where they're both trying to enjoy watching a show and their needs are in conflict. So, and that's okay. No one's doing anything wrong. No one's bad, right? They just have different needs. So then they can discuss what they wanna do about it. But I think it's very important to acknowledge that you can make a game, a situation more accessible for one person and then that unintentionally ends up making it less accessible for another person. So talk to the people who are participating, ask them what they specifically need. If there's a conflict, that's okay. It's not personal, work through the conflict. Uh, another example of this is emotional support dogs. So uh, some buildings are no dog buildings, right? So they say we don't allow dogs, but by the law, if you have an emotional support dog, you can overrule what a building uh, restricts. So the building can say no dogs, you have an emotional support dog, you're allowed to bring your dog into the premises. But 
there might be people who specifically moved into that building because they have dog allergies or phobias. So all of a sudden, one person's accessibility need is in conflict with another person's. Uh, so it's important to keep that in mind. So in case I run out of time, which I think I'm about to, I wanna make sure that we do not uh, miss this, which is if you only remember three things today, uh, I want you to take a look at the RPG safety toolkit. Uh, this is a free toolkit by Kiana Shaw and Lauren Bryant Monk. Uh, this is a place that collects a variety of tools. Take a look at them, they're free and uh, figure out what makes sense for you. Similarly, there's a resource, free resource called Consent in Gaming uh, that also collects a variety of tools uh, that is also extremely useful. So if you only do two things today, check out Consent in Gaming, check out TT RPG Safety Toolkit, read the different techniques and tools that they present, and figure out what makes the most sense for you, for your group. And if you're a designer, I would highly suggest design your own, right? Figure out what makes sense for you specifically, for your context, and then integrate them. Uh, do I have any more time left? Uh, you're right on the dot, but is there something super important you want to share with us? Yeah, I'll say one last thing. Uh, this is something that I know a lot of people don't like talking about, So, uh, which is, let's talk about very briefly for one minute, uh, PTSD. As I mentioned earlier, I have had PTSD and anything can be a trigger. Uh, there are situations where a tool that's designed to be psychologically safe can itself be a trigger. So for example, I mentioned the X card earlier. That's a tool that allows you while you're playing game to use it and to identify content that you would like to edit out of the game. Now, generally speaking, most people I've spoken to enjoy having that as an option. It doesn't work for everyone. It works for a lot of people, but specifically there are folks who might have a certain form of trauma that is triggered by that situation because they might have experienced trauma around gaslighting uh, being told that something didn't happen. And so if you have a tool that you use to take something that happened out of your game and to say that never happened, to edit it out, that might actually remind someone of their traumatic experiences. So I just want to give an example where even a tool that a lot of people use successfully can still be the wrong tool for a specific person. The only way you're going to know is to not assume, to ask people for consent to use specific tools, ask them what their specific accommodation needs are, and then design for the specific people you are engaged with. And that's it. Thank you so much. Uh I'm going to have to watch that over and over again, I think, because there are so many clusters of information that um, are gold in there. Uh, I could give examples, but I'd rather focus on the questions. Um, so Evan is asking, how does one market this game expertise in non-game circles? In corporate consulting, it is often inherently invalidated unless there is a quote unquote inside person in the organization who already knows what we're offering. You're muted. Uh, thank you for that. Psychological safety is a phrase and a technique that only now has become fairly commonplace in a lot of large organizations. So there are a lot of uh, director level and above uh, job positions at companies where they explicitly list uh, being able to make your teams more psychologically safe or implementing systemic uh, processes within your company to increase psychological safety as a requirement for the job itself. So, but that's, that's very new. It's something that uh, is going to increase. It's something that Google specifically introduced, which was a non-gaming thing. Uh, so I think it's something that is getting better. 
uh, and I would suggest referencing the Google research that we talked about. And I think if you go to somewhere like LinkedIn, uh, where you can see a variety of jobs from different companies, search for the term psychological safe, psychologically safe, and you're going to see a lot of information come up. See how these different companies are phrasing that, and then you utilize that language. Uh, somebody's wondering, will the written materials for this lecture be made available afterwards? Uh, sure, maybe not immediately afterwards. We'll need to format it appropriately, but yes, we'll make it available. Okay. And whenever you send it to me, I can just add it to the video uh, comments. Uh, so for those of you who have burning questions, uh, please feel free to ask them in the chat or in the question and answer, I should say. Um, Joe's wondering, much of the examples of D&D are based on design elements. How do you compare this to the impact of facilitation and leadership on psychological safety? Also considering that group dynamics are another major factor. I want to make sure I'm answering the exact question. Can we go through it one more time? Sure. So we so, talked about, go ahead. Much of the examples of D&D are based on the design elements. So what is the mm -hmm. impact of leadership and group dynamics in this whole picture? Oh, wow. Okay, that's a great question. Uh, so my perspective, uh, the answer is not a great answer in terms <laughs> of like how this affects everything, but I think that the specific leadership and the specific uh, participants <gasps> and the group dynamics uh, overrule any design intentions, right? Especially in terms of a role-playing game, because unlike a video game where a lot of the structure is enforced through the game itself, in a role-playing game, the structure is brought in via the participants themselves. They act as a filter. So if they themselves either don't understand specific elements or don't agree with specific elements or want to do it differently, nothing stops them from doing it. So I would say that the design ultimately uh, is can be negated by the leaders and the participants. That said, it comes back to modeling behavior. If you have more and more uh, Twitch streamers, YouTube streamers, uh, D&D designers, various public people, people at conventions, uh, modeling variety of techniques that are built into these designs, then it increases the chances that it will enter the individual cultures of these groups. Yeah, and related to that, I'm thinking of um, Charles Ken Peterson's article uh, that safety tools don't create safety, but they do create safety culture. So even openly discussing safety um, can help people feel psychologically safe. Um, so how does that tie into modeling behavior in your experience? I mean, I think that um, people are used to being told one thing and the people saying the thing do another. So I think we unfortunately have situations, especially in companies where people are like, oh, we're an inclusive company. We care about our employees. And then their actions don't, in fact, uh, line up with those statements. So I think modeling the behaviors and focusing on the culture is also a way to prove that we actually intend on using these tools correctly and care about the results. And if these tools are not working for our specific people, we will change those tools because we care about the end result and the outcomes, not the specific bureaucracy. And connected to something that you said earlier, um, just doing the easy fixes is not fully modeling the behavior, right? It's just yeah. kind of the surface gloss uh, and the real underlying things might still be, be very problematic. I mean, one thing I will add to that is I know, unfortunately, that uh, we're bombarded with so much information, especially as an employee in a company, that if you hear something one time, it might be gone tomorrow, right? Not, not only does it mean that it comes in one ear out the other, but literally in the organization, the organization itself might forget about the thing. So people are trained that until they've heard something a fourth, a fifth, a sixth, a seventh time, that's when it becomes real, not the first few times they've heard it. 
And it's also very relevant to us in education and therapy and you know, all these different modalities. So for a workshop where people specifically come to try, mess up and improve their DMing skills, what main guidelines would you recommend that establish the framework for psychological safety and the freedom to mess up? And by guidelines, I mean social contract in the beginning of a workshop stating how we as a group aim to be together. Interesting. So I think what I would do is in the workshop, I would, I would make time specifically for assessing what the different people in the group think psychological safety means for them. What would individually help them feel more psychologically safe? So specifically make time for each group to actually ask those questions. Uh, give them a variety of tools to choose from. I mentioned the TTRPG safety toolkit, print out uh, or make available digitally a variety of options. Let them choose the options most appropriate to what they just individually discuss. So let each group do different things. And then check in, because uh, I'm assuming workshops typically are anywhere from one hour, two hours, three hours, four hours. Check in halfway or every quarter and verify, let's say, hey, we all discussed that uh, the following is important to us. We chose the following tools to support that. But now that we've actually had a chance to work through this together for an hour, do we still feel this way? Do we actually want to change which tools we're using? Or do we actually have different meanings for what psychological safety is? Check in, revise those options, and then go from there. I'm also thinking just in terms of the workshop that um, we co-designed together with uh, Sarah Hart and Samara Haley Steele, the crisis yeah. management workshop, where we actually role play with facilitators um, what it would be like if somebody's in a uh, crisis. Um, I'll give you a link to that one so that you can take a look at it. It has some scenarios, but absolutely feel free to, uh, to make your own. I'll just give you the whole safety link. And there's also a French translation which may be helpful for some of your communities. But I'm just thinking about like that whole concept of practice. Sometimes you have to be in yeah. the fire, right? I think that's completely correct. And I wish as I gave my answer, I thought about that. So I'm so, I'm so glad that you brought it up, uh, which is to say that practice is key. So I think that if you talk about what makes sense for your group, you choose the appropriate tools, and then you have a way to check in and measure how it's going, that still doesn't mean it's gonna work out because you might not actually have an opportunity to practice what you're discussing. So I would then say that I think it's important to simulate examples of where this would occur. So we chose a tool, let's see what that actually would look like. Let's role play out a scenario where X thing would occur that would necessitate for our group utilizing the tool and let's see how that actually works step-by-step. Step. So making time to actually practice and if, uh, uh, if a situation does not naturally occur that creates the opportunity to practice, come up with one. And I think there's just such a difference between learning something, um, you know, either orally or written in written form and embodied learning, you know, just actually having an experience of using the X card and what that felt like in your body and how people responded to it is very different than reading the article about it. 100%. Okay, we've got another qu couple questions. Curious if and how being in disparate virtual spaces may influence some of these techniques. How might we approach design principles of psychological safety differently given lack of face-to-face in-person interactions, people inhabiting their own individual personal spaces, or on the positive side, availability of digital tools that don't exist in person? Great question. Uh, so I think that uh, it's a twofold thing. So I think if you try to use all the tools exist that exist now as is and ignore that the context has changed, I think that they don't work as well. But I think uh, virtual workshops, uh, games, et cetera, create whole new opportunities to actually uh, increase the effectiveness of these tools if you uh, alter them specifically for this context. So what I mean by that is 
uh, instead of taking a uh, index card and right, you know, putting a pause symbol on it and raising it to indicate that you would like to pause the game, uh, there are a variety of emojis that you could use that do that within the context of a Discord or a Zoom. Uh, you could do a thing where you utilize the chat as a way to discuss meta information outside of the characters where you would like to indicate that you would want to pause to have a conversation or edit some content, I would change the way in which we actually communicate these techniques that takes advantage of the mediums that we're using to play virtual games. I've actually sent you screenshots of like, there's an actually an X built into Zoom, not in the webinar, but in the, the meeting. So you can actually click X and have it look at X up in the corner. Um, there's also thumbs up. So for people who use the OK check-in, there's thumbs up and th thumbs down. So you can literally just click the button um, if you remember to do that, of course, which is always the issue with safety techniques. Um, another thing that's really interesting that I just want to put out there is some people say that safety is a lot easier in these kinds of environments. Um, GMs will say that people feel a lot more comfortable sending a private message to them or, or X carding something privately to them than they would in the entire group, like passing a note to someone because that's more visible. So that's another thing to think of is actually the affordances of this, uh, this space. Yeah, and I, I would add to that, um, and I agree 100%, I would add that look at the specific tool you're using. Let's talk about Zoom as an example. Look at what's already built into Zoom and figure out a way to utilize those specific features uh, for these techniques rather than trying to force fit uh, tools onto something that might not make sense, right? So instead of coming up with, in the chat window, we'll use these specific keywords to like signal to each other. Well, you don't need to do that if you can do a thumbs up or a thumbs down. So look at what the tools already come with and try to utilize those specifically. A live game, similar to an immersive theater experience where an actor within a role as in character interacts live in person with a player who can have been adequately briefed uh, regarding participating in the experience and probably have a role in it. What would be good design principles in this circumstance to ensure psychological safety during the actor player interaction? What kind of framework slash awareness slash knowledge bestowed upon the actor and the player would help facilitate a psychologically safe interaction? So just to be clear, now we're talking about immersive theater, which is slightly different from role-playing games in that someone is a professional actor that is delivering an experience and the audience is there receiving it, but also able to interact. Yeah, I, so I think that um, because it's a different medium, even though it's highly related, I think the first thing I would wanna do is identify the problems that are occurring in that specific medium. So like, because depending on what the specific problems arise and what the needs are, we may apply different solutions. So for example, if someone is touching someone without permission, that's a specific problem and we would come up with a rule for that. Um, if it has to do with how people are talking to each other or how they address each other, uh, that's gonna require a different set of tools. So I think step one, identify uh, from both the actors and both the participants, what sort of problems are arising and looking for patterns, right? To identify where the core primary issues. And then in terms of the actors, um, I would, and I think many of them already do this, I would practice those scenarios. Just like we were talking about practicing in the context of a workshop. I know a lot of the actors like for Sleep No More, for example, in New York City, I know they do this. So they role play out uh, and practice a situation where a, uh, an audience member acts inappropriately. What does that person do? Who do they go speak to? Uh, what does that look like in different rooms at the event, right? So let's say one of the uh, answers is go talk to a security person. Well, is there a security person that's close enough in that situation? Do we need to move where the different security people are physically located to actually make them more accessible? Those are all sort of things that you would practice and then given your specific environment, make adjustments accordingly. You could also do onboarding for the actual participants. So just because the audience members 
are uh, are not professional actors, you could still carve out five, 10 minutes to onboard them and we'll go the, through the various situations to set expectations, set boundaries and make it clear to them what you expect from them. So uh, I wanted to go back to something that you talked about earlier that I wasn't sure about how to actually handle in practice, which is when you have sort of dueling accommodation needs. So, you know, what happens with the captioning situation? Because it seems like it's one person in that situation is going to lose and one person is going to win in terms of having their needs met. Um, so I'm just curious, like, wow. I'm, and I don't like and ors, I like both and. So, you know, obviously we can get creative of, of what it would look like, um, but I'm just wondering how you would handle that if you're presented with these two differing accommodation needs. So for me, uh, I, while I, I have some elements of ADHD, I don't have the specific kinds that are relevant to this example. Uh, so I will speak to what I've seen people do who do have these, who do have these needs and what they've done. So what I've seen people do is I've seen a person who requires the use of uh, subtitles have a situation where they watch a version of the movie or show on their phone, right? So then that way, as they are watching it, they have subtitles that they could put in front of themselves almost in the same physical location that they would be on the screen, right? Given their eyesight. Uh, and then that way, the person who has ADHD doesn't have to see the subtitles. So the subtitles are still there, but you're limiting who has access to them and how they're being interacted with in a way that's accommodating to both needs. So that would be one example that I've actually seen. I'm just Speaking from personal experience, you know, I've been in LARP situations where um, I have my own PTSD triggers. Um, unfortunately, a lot of them are around yelling and loud, sounds, <laughs> which means in a LARP, a horror LARP, let's say, like, you know, I'm going to get triggered a lot. And the response, you know, that I often got from people was, well, maybe this game isn't for you. And that can be our default response. So, you know, kind of going back to the principles that you outlined in this talk, what would you say to that? To the people saying this is not a game for you or how? That approach, how... you know. So I think, uh, I do think there are circumstances where it is valid that a specific game is not for specific people because of constraints. Uh, I think that if that's the case, make sure people know well in advance uh, make that information of easily available so that the person making a choice how they want to spend their time knows that this is not going to be an activity that is friendly to their needs. So make that clear up front. Uh, in terms of surprising someone, if you were to surprise someone with this information, I don't think it's awesome to like tell them get lost. <laughs> Right. So I think that if someone signed up for a thing and you've not properly uh, set expectations uh, and now they've lost their opportunity to play something differently, I would I would do what you can. I would spend at least five minutes brainstorming how you could still in some form or fashion provide accommodations for the, that person, even if, it, even if it means altering what you have prepared already for the game, if it's if it's a reasonable amount of alterations, I think in that context, it's well worth doing. So spend five minutes, talk about it. I mean, what I what I would do in that situation to kind of de-escalate it, to make it as calm as possible, is grab a bunch of index cards, pass them around, and ask people to anonymously write down ideas about what could be done to accommodate different needs, collect that, take a look at them. If there's ones that you don't agree with or can't do, you don't even have to say that. Just look for the ones that you can actually implement, choose that one, talk to the person affected and say, hey, I'm thinking maybe we could do this. Would this work for you? And if not, is there something you could change about it where it would indeed work for you? And then I'll go from there. You could do that mm -hmm. fast. And just to be clear, the, the people running the game were very accommodating to me. This was more something from other players and an overall um, attitude, I think, that over time, uh, awareness around trauma started rising up in the collective and there, you, there was a lot more of sort of a reckoning around it as well as well as consent. So I don't want to, you know, pigeonhole anybody, but um, 
you know, I, I think it's important for us to realize that um, safety culture is something that's cultivated over time. So it doesn't matter how many tools you have. Uh, if, if, the, if the, the fact that it, it became a phrase that we had to say in workshops that people are more important than games indicates that in some spaces, that's just not the case. Like you mentioned earlier that you're a person-centered uh, designer. Why would that even need to be expressed if it was, wasn't the case that oftentimes design is not focused on personal experience, but rather on the design itself? I mean, that, that's why it became a term in, uh, for professional product designers, because you used to have a lot of designers that used to be artists or fine artists who then went into design because it was a way to make money, which I empathize with because we need money to survive, but they're artists, not designers. Uh, and that causes a problem when you have a project and need someone to actually design for a specific audience to solve a specific problem rather than self-expressing. So I think it's, it is important to make set those expectations to be clear. Is it okay if I add one more detail to this? Uh, so one thing I would mention is avoid dogma. <laughs> like do everything you can to avoid all or nothing situations, avoid dogma. Uh, if let's say you're using a tool like the X card, which has an X on it, you lift it up, you can edit out content in the middle of a game. As I mentioned, for some people that itself might be a trigger. Um, but the change to that tool is minimal that might address someone's needs, right? So I know I've, I know at least two people who fall in that category and for them, they feel a lot better that if instead of just saying, I don't want this thing, if you also say, instead of that thing, can we please do this other thing, then they're totally okay with it. Uh, and that, that technique might not make sense for all groups, right? You might not in the moment be able to think of an alternative option, but if it works for that group and that specific change would allow everyone to participate equally, then I would personally suggest that you make those changes. Don't be dogmatic, take a moment, don't assume, really hear people and think about what changes you could make to be accommodating. And um, going back to the gaslighting example, I've also heard that argument before about the X card. Um, and sometimes that change might be, because usually with the X card, it's no questions asked. So if someone's triggered or someone's activated in some way, um, we don't want to interrogate them about what's going on yeah. with them and make them voice it. But for people who've experienced gaslighting, then they don't feel like they have space to actually talk about why they're triggered. And they, they don't have the opportunity to feel the support of the group that would have made it them feel safer to keep going. So, you know, that's something that you don't know unless you experience it, unfortunately, probably. Um, which is part of the issue with a lot of these safety tools. We've, we've just, you know, developed them because out of need, right? Like out of, yeah. out of mistakes that have been made or out of um, needs that have arisen. Um, so I thought that was a really, really interesting example as well. And again, that's something that, especially in a small group, like a tabletop role playing game is pretty easy to do if you can get everybody on board. So it's a little bit harder in a large scale LARP, I would say. And, and, and there's you can a lot do of individual no negotiations in that case. And, and there's a lot of variance there. So just because uh, the, per the person setting a boundary doesn't have to answer any questions doesn't mean that they can't offer information, right? It's a protection for them rather than uh, limiting what they can say. But I've also known groups that literally do limit what you can say. They say, cool, we'll edit it out, but we don't want to know why. And we don't want to have a conversation about it. So some people set that as a boundary. Uh, and then as you mentioned, Sarah, like if I'm triggered and disassociated and I'm being asked to essentially be a dungeon master in the moment, I won't be able to, right? That's not how that works for specific people. So I think it's all comes back to do what it makes the most sense for the specific people. But as you mentioned, if you have a LARP and you have a hundred people that becomes more difficult. So in that sort of scenario, offer multiple preset options and then choose from those preset options. That reminds me of uh, accessibility as well. Going back to the accessibility question, uh, we went to a LARP called Marked, which is about superheroes going to like college, I think, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and one thing I was really impressed by is they would outline the, 
the mods, if you will, the different like adventures, quests you could go on. And they would tell you the, le the level of accessibility needs that are there. So this will require this amount of physical activity. This will happen on hills. You know, um, this will be, you know, this amount of scary, probably, you know, that it'll be dark. These kinds of things, it, it really showed that they had thought through potential things that uh, could come up. And so I think big takeaway that I have uh, from your talk is that that sort of reaction of this is not the LARP for you, or this is not the game for you. Oftentimes it might be with just a little bit of creative thinking and a, a sort of we attitude. All right, well, that's the top of the half hour at least. Um, thank you so, so much for this wonderful talk. And it's always such a delight to be able to, to pick your brain on these topics. And thank you all of you for, for joining us today. Our next talk is going to be by Electra uh, Diacolambriou, who is a psychotherapist. And she's gonna talk about uh, the use of uh, role-playing for personal transformation, as well as in psychotherapeutic contexts. So be on the lookout for more information about that later. All right, thank you very much. We'll hopefully see you next time. Thank you so much, everyone. It's been a pleasure.